I was sitting in a classroom along with my classmates, my college, waiting for Dr. T to come and start his lecture. We waited and waited and waited for 15 minutes. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of uh, academic quarter. In some parts of the world, in some academic context, if uh, you waited for 15 minutes on your professor and they didn't show up, you're good to go. It was almost that time when one of my classmates stood up and speaking on his phone left the classroom. Then after a few seconds, maybe a minute, he came back and uh, he said, guys, we're good to go. He's not coming. And we're like, what do you mean he's not coming? Because just the previous day, we had class together. And before he left the class, he said, see you tomorrow, guys. How do you know he's not coming? And he said, somebody came from the city. This professor was a commuter. And told me he's not coming. And with that, he took his belongings and left the classroom. We looked at one another and followed suit. A few minutes later, I was up in my dorm, ready to take a nap. When my interphone started to ring. Usually when you wanted to take a nap during the day, the first thing you wanted to do is to disconnect that inner phone. But I didn't do that yet, so I'm answering the phone, and down at the entrance of the boy's dorm, who do you think was? It was Dr. T, and he told me, hi, Joseph, we have class together, don't we? I was like, yeah, I guess, now that you are telling me. So, in a few minutes, all those that were in the dorm, and of course, some already had left uh, to the city, because this was a school outside of the city, all those that were still in the dorm, we were dressed and we were heading to the classroom. Dr. T was waiting for us, visibly stirred by the whole incident. So after everybody sat down, he looked at us and he asked, guys, why did you all leave? And somebody said, well, we were told you were not coming. And he asked, did I tell you I wasn't coming? Who told you I wasn't going to come? Somebody told us, guys, that Jesus is no longer coming. And this morning, I would like us to sit in front of him or stand before him because he may want to ask us, did I tell you I wasn't coming? Who told you I wasn't coming? The title of my sermon this morning is he said he's coming, so he's coming. 
He said his coming, so his coming. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are standing in front of you, uh, sitting in front of you, with the desire that you will speak to us. We pray that through the Holy Spirit, you will reveal the depths of this passage to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The last decade of the first century AD was a very difficult time for the fledging Christian church. The internal and external attacks, the challenges and uh, the hostilities they had to face transformed many of those local churches into crucibles. Yes, the cross, preaching the cross, and uh, living out the teaching of the cross can easily transform your life into a crucible at that time, the life of those local churches in Asia Minor were transformed, was transformed into a crucible, crucible. In AD 81, Domitian became the emperor of Rome. Now, this guy was a silly billy that should have never sat on a throne. His elder brother, Titus, he was supposed to be the ruler. He was supposed to be the king. Uh, this guy, Titus, was a well-built, very intelligent, uh, brilliant military commander. He was actually the one that overcame Jerusalem and even destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. At that time, his father, Vespasian, was the king. But in AD 79, after Vespasian passed away, Titus became the ruler. Only two years into his reign, Titus died. And that placed his clumsy brother, Domitian, on the throne of Rome. Now, once this guy saw himself enthroned, he started envisioning himself as an enlightened despot destined to drive Rome to new heights, destined to direct the destiny of Rome toward a new era of brilliance. He wanted to make Rome great again. And he tried. Surrounded by his propaganda machinery, the enlightened monarch crafted a crazy and cruel cult of personality. He demanded worship. Now, that was not new for Rome, because some of uh, his predecessors did the same. Remember Caligula? 
But whenever somebody sitting on the throne of Rome was demanded, uh, demanding worship, the cities of the Roman province Asia Minor were stirred again and again because now they were again in competition. There was an ongoing rivalry among them who is more loved or the most loved by the emperor. And uh, obviously the, the rule was this. The more you love the emperor, the more you worship the emperor, and therefore more privileges will be bestowed upon you by the emperor. This was all fine for most of the people in those areas, but for Christians, this could not go. Because Christians already had a king they worshipped. They had King Jesus Christ they decided to worship, and in their mind, the worship of the kingdom of Rome and the worship of King Jesus were not compatible. So they would refuse the systematic attempt of local authorities to impose, to enforce emperor worship on them. It was in that context that John the Apostle was exiled to Patmos. Most possibly, he ran into some difficulties with local authorities. And he was sent to a sort of an Alcatraz of those days. You know what Alcatraz means. He was a political, dangerous fellow. Now, there in his isolation, in his solitude, John the Apostle has time to think about life, to pray about his fears, to ask himself and try to answer the question, what is going on? What is going on with this movement that was established by Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, he left. He promised to come back, but he has not come back. What's going on with him? Is he going to come or not? And one Sabbath, as he was struggling, but spending time in the Spirit, the glorified, resurrected Jesus Christ showed up to him, walking among seven candlesticks or lampstands. And the message of Jesus Christ walking among the seven lampstands conveyed to him was very powerful. John, stop being afraid. I am here. Don't worry. Don't be in despair. Don't think that this clumsy king of Rome, this syllabi is going to throw the whole world in disarray and nobody will be in control. No, I'm here. I'm here making sure that the light will never go out. I'm here trimming those lamps. I'm here ensuring that no matter what, light will go on. Because I am the light of the world. And you are the light of the world. And he tells John in chapter 1, verse 11, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. 
And the first movie out of seven movies that John sees in the book of Revelation presents Jesus Christ as being the one that ensures light, but he also has a message to each one of those seven churches, to each one in that specific order, starting with Ephesus and ending with Laodicea. Now, it's interesting to notice that in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, you will find a customized message to every single church out of these seven. At the same time, please notice that there is a seven in one. Because all seven messages were sent out to how many? To all seven of them. So each one had a specific message, but all seven messages, along with the rest of the book, with the other visions, all this content was sent to all seven churches. And there's something very weird if you think about the reader that has to decipher this message. At the end of every single message, Jesus Christ repeats the exact same words. Anybody can tell me what those words are? Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. That is in the first message, but all seven messages have the same exact wording. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is there a difference in significance if you have church or churches in this saying? Because Jesus could have said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Singular. Meaning, if uh, this is the church of Ephesus and you are in the church of Ephesus, you should listen carefully to the message that is intended to the church of Ephesus. If, say, you are right here in the middle, what is right here in the middle? What church? Out of the seven. Thyatira, if you're here, then you should be listening to what? To the message, like really listening to the message that goes to this church. If you're, say, right here at the church of Philadelphia, you should be listening to that message. Or if you're here at Laodicea, then the Laodicean message is specifically for you, therefore you listen to that specific message. Does that make sense? But that's not what the text says. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Meaning, no matter if you are here in Ephesus or in uh, Smyrna or in Pergamos or in Thyatira or in Sardis or in Philadelphia or in Laodicea, you should be listening to all the messages. Not only superficial, but very carefully. He who has an ear, let him hear. This is important. Because John knows this kind of language. He had heard Jesus speaking this way in the past. Some decades back, there were situations where Jesus was speaking to the people using some riddles or some parables because he wanted to reveal and conceal at the same time. He wanted for some people to get it and some other people to miss it. And he had a saying. 
You can read it, for instance, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because the way Jesus uses these words in the Gospels, but also here in the book of Revelation, is a sort of warning, 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 warning. It's like you have a picture on a screen, and then you have that warning light on. What is the meaning of the words, he who has an ear, let him hear? It's warning. Look carefully or listen carefully because there is a hidden message. There is a coded message. There is a message at a deeper level or there is a message behind the message. Listen carefully, not only to your church. Listen to the message that is sent to all the churches, because there is something in there. You have to get it. You have to understand it. Do you still remember why, why the book of Revelation was coded? Because it had to pass censorship. I had a chance to watch an interview with a guy. He was an elderly guy at the time of the interview. Now he passed. But back in the 50s, he used to be the leader of the Romanian anti-communist anti -communist resistance in France. Meaning that some of these very bright young people were sort of exiled. They could not go back home. So they would create all kinds of operations from the outside. Among other things, they would parachute crazy young people across the border to go and spy, to give them information. So he says, one day I receive a letter. And in the letter, this is what is said. I'm in hospital. I need 2,000 units of green penicillin. Sylvia. And he said, I knew what that meant. It wasn't Sylvia, it was Silvio. It was a guy. And he was not in prison, not, not in hospital, he was in prison. He did not need penicillin, he needed $2,000. Because the message was this. I got intercepted by the communists. And uh, I'm arrested. I need 2,000 green penicillin. That was code for the color of the dollar. To get out of here. See how this works? But, but for this kind of code to work, they had to have a previous agreement on it. They had to agree, hey, this is how we write. This is how we communicate. I don't think John at the time of his uh, period of time on Patmos, because later on, according to some historical uh, data, he was released from there. I don't think they had a previous agreement. So Jesus Christ, the one that is sending the message to the seven churches, he himself comes up with the code. A code that they can understand even if there's no previous agreement on it. Let me, let me try to illustrate this. Imagine Pastor Joe is exiled on Alcatraz. Okay? Hope that's not prophecy. <laughs> but, but imagine he's, he's out there. He's on that island. You know where that is. It's around San Francisco somewhere. We're not too far. Okay? But, but he cannot come back. And God, imagine, re reveals to him the history of the Seventh-day Adventist church from this point all the way to the end. And now he's supposed to communicate that with you guys. Because 
Pastor Joe, even in Alcatraz, still loves you. So he tries to find a way to convey that message that can pass censorship. What should I do? Re the revelation is about the history of uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church from this point all the way to the end. What should I do? Well, this is what I would do. First, I would try to find a way to divide this time period from this moment up to the end in seven time periods. Does that make sense? Does it or not? Well, it does. Why? Because you already know the significance of seven. You know seven is what? Complete. But at the same time, seven is a cycle of time. Because you have, right from the first pages of the Bible, you have six plus seven. So you have a week of days. Later on in the Bible, there's also week of years. So you have already this concept. But then I would need some more to code this information. And this is what I would do. You know, in Orange County, there is a number of churches. I don't know exactly how many, but I know there is more than seven. Just like in Asia Minor, there were more than just seven churches. Does that make sense? So don't think that there were seven churches in Asia Minor and that's why God sent that message to all the seven churches. No, there were more churches and he picked, he handpicked, he cherry-picked if you want, seven out of them. So I would pick seven churches here in Orange County and I would pick the churches that are somehow connected to I-5. To the interstate. Obviously, none of these churches are right on the interstate, but you can access these churches from the interstate. Okay? And then I will start describing them in a certain order, coming from north to the south, or from up, down. And then I would send that message to all seven churches, and at the end of each message, of each description of those churches that I know, I would write, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And when you receive that letter, you're like, huh? Why is this almost obsessive repetition in the text? After every single message, the same thing. Why? And you may even want to meet with some people from the other churches, because now you know you are more than just one church involved. You, you are the last one as you come from uh, north to south. But you want to get together and try to discern what is the message. Something like this is happening in the book of Revelation. I have a map that I would like to show you to see how this works. See, you have a map of Turkey there. And uh, you have on this side the Aegean Sea, or Aegean, de depending on how you pronounce it. That's where the island Patmos is. And then you have Ephesus, that's the first church that is closest to the ocean, actually to the sea there. And then you go up north to Smyrna, and then Pergamos, again north. Then you come a little east and down south to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And you always have the same order. Why is that important? Because in those days, 
the male coach goes on that route. It's the postal carriage. It was the FedEx of that time. No? Or if you want more modern terms, uh, the, the Amazon, how do you call that machine? The drone would go that way. Because the Romans established roads and they established communication. Whenever you have dictatorship, they want to give an impression that even if there are some rules and regulations, there is still rights that people can benefit of. So he told John, send that letter to all seven of them. So now you, you have the letter and you look at it and you read it and you realize, ah, we have to look deeper. Because there is this warning in every letter, every little message, that something has to be discovered here. And this is the deeper meaning. If you just look at the seven churches in those times, in those days, the seven churches of Asia Minor, if you have a synchronic view of the seven churches, then your conclusion will be that the seven churches, the message of the seven churches only applies to them there. But if you discover the code, you will realize, no, there's more to it, because the seven churches actually outline the history of Christianity from this time all the way to the end of history, of history the way we know it. Because then there is history beyond history. When God creates a new earth and new heavens. So this is what it would look like. Instead of only having a diachronic view of the churches, you have now a, uh, or a, a synchronic view of the churches. You have now a diachronic view, which means you look in a chronological order. And what is only a church at first sight becomes a time period. And you have the first period, second, and third. And you go on and on until you reach the seventh period. And the seventh period, I don't have enough space, so I'm going to do like in maths, dot, 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 and then you have it. But here is here's the thing. If you look in the text, the text itself indicates this is the way of interpreting the churches. For instance, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, both the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Meaning, in the first section of the book, the seven churches, there are things that are and things that will take place. But right after the first section of the book, chapters 2 and 3, at the beginning of chapter 4, please notice what changes. From that point on, everything that is described is what takes place after this. So, even if in the case of the churches you have both a synchronic view and a diachronic view of the churches, when it comes to the seven seals or seven trumpets, it clearly outlines history from the time of John all the way to the end 
of Earth's sinful history. And that same reality can be seen in the chiastic structure of the book. Please place that chiastic structure up there. Look how the first, second, and third section of the book, out of the seven, because you have seven sections, three one side, three on the other side, and one in the middle. The three sections, the first three sections, all three of them have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the time period they cover is the same time period of history from John's time all the way to the end of time. But now you, you would think, so what was the code in the message of the seven churches that they had to pay attention to? Why was Jesus saying again and again, he who has an ear, let him hear? Well, there is something right in the text. And that's what I would like us to see right now. When you get here, and this is the middle of the seven, this is the church of what? Thyatira. In the message of Thyatira, there is something interesting. Chapter 2, verse 20 and 26 but hold fast what you have till I come says Jesus did you get that picture and he who overcomes and keeps my words until the end he says so hold fast what you have till I come go forward to the next one what is the next one? Sardis. And what is in the message of Sardis that is important to notice? Therefore, if you will not watch, <clears throat> I will come upon you as a thief. Is there a difference between I will come and I will come as a thief? Is there a difference? Yeah, there is a difference there. It's, it's one thing if I tell you, hey, I'm going to come to you, or I tell you I'm going to come to you as a thief. But then move one more church down. It says, behold, I am coming. How? Quickly. Are you getting it? So here it says... I am, I will come, I will come, very general. Here, I will come as a thief. Here, I will, I am coming quickly. Now you wonder what should happen here. Hmm? What should happen here in the last time period? Behold, he says, I stand at the door. What door? What door? I was waiting for that. At the door of your heart. Because we imagine the heart as having a cute little door, don't we? There's a heart, and that heart has a cute little door. Do you know how you call a cute little door? Adorable. So you have your heart, and your heart has that cute little door called adorable and Jesus is knocking at the door of your adorable heart. And you will open. Now, that is in a way a correct interpretation. But please 
listen or read the whole verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Now, if I tell you, hey, I want to come to you to dine with you and you will tell me, yes, I'm going to prepare a nice dinner for you in my heart because I have such an adorable heart. Will that work? Do you understand the problem there with that interpretation? Okay, take it symbolically. Take it the way you want. What I'm trying to convey is there must be something more here than just the door of the heart. There's a, a deeper meaning there. What do you need so that the one that wants to come in can sit down with you and eat, dine with you? You need a home, you need a house. I remember years ago, I was visiting in a village with uh, a family, uh, one, of, one of my elders there, and uh, when I got to their house, I saw the wife, very gifted uh, cook, she was running to and fro, um, it was obvious she was preparing for something, she was cleaning, she was uh, cooking, so uh, I look at her and uh, ask her, Sister Mary, what are you preparing for? What is going on? And she says, Pastor, they are coming. Who's coming? And she says, my, my son and his family are coming. They lived in Spain and, and the parents lived in Romania, so they were waiting for them to come home. And she said, I'm preparing the food. I, I want to have this big family reunion, you know, where everybody's together, eating together. Oh, I can't wait, Pastor. So I look at her and uh, I say, okay, but what if they don't come? And she, she, was, she was shocked. She was like, huh? she didn't think about that. So uh, her face turned a little bit. But then the light came back and she said, no. He said, they are coming, so they are coming. And that fixed it for her. And they came, indeed, and they had that family reunion in the home, in their home, because they all belong to that home. Jesus wants to enter your heart. He wants to enter your house, your home. But still, there is something deeper here. A few decades prior, Jesus was teaching his disciples on a mountain called Mount Olive, or the Mount of Olives. And in Matthew 24, this is what Jesus tells them. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is, please say that word for me aloud, summer is near, 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 near. And now, verse 33, so you also, when you see all of these things, what things? All these things. Not these things, no, no, no. The things that you see in the news. The things that are almost overlapping with what Jesus was describing in Matthew 24 about the destruction of Jerusalem or the end of the world, because there's a double picture there. He says, when you see all these things happening, know that He is near. Near where? Right at the At the doors. Ah, deeper meaning. Right at the doors. Because yes, there's doors of the heart. Wonderful. Open it up. 
There's doors of the home, of the house. Yes, open it up. There's also doors of history, if I may say so. Because at this point here, right at the end of, of the history of Christianity, there's an overlap among all three of three these doors, of these doors, heart, home, and history. Because here, Jesus has something in view. He says, if they hear my voice and let me in, I enter, I will dine with them. That's one thing. But why does he add, and they will also dine with me? If I sit down with you to dine with you, isn't that understood without saying Revelation 19, verse 9, Jesus speaking, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The word is the same that can be translated as dinner, the marriage dinner of the Lamb. Are you putting the picture together now? Of course, because Jesus wants to eat with us down here. He wants to be in our hearts and in our homes to dine with us. But He also wants to eat with us or dine with us up there. And that's what is called the marriage dinner or supper of the Lamb. Isn't it now obvious why Jesus was repeating to them, he who has an ear, let him hear. Because there was a deeper meaning than just the synchronic view of the churches. History is outlined. And one more important thing in this picture of Jesus knocking on your door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he will dine and dine with him and he with me. So Jesus is knocking. What else is he doing? Based on the text. What? Speaking. I would say he's shouting. How do I know? Well, in those days, you would rarely, if ever, hear somebody knock on your door. You know what they would do? They would first shout and wait. I know this firsthand because I grew up in a culture like that. In those days when I was a child at home, there were in our city, in, in our uh, village, there were two gypsy colonies, on one on one end of the village, one on the other end. And uh, gypsies would not have cows. They would not raise cattle. They would have horses. They would use milk in uh, their kitchen. So they would go into the village to buy milk. So I remember when a gypsy lady would come to our house because we had cows, we had cattle, plenty, and we would sell milk. Uh, she would come to the front yard and she would shout, it was very funny because she would not shout using my mom's real name. My mom's name is Mary. But uh, the gypsy lady would shout something like uh, Lady Sabbatarian or Lady Sabbath Keeper. <laughs> yeah, that's real. Because we were known in the, in the village as Sabbatarians. As Sabbath 
keepers. So she would, she would yell, Lady Sabbath Keeper! And for quite some time, I thought that was another name for my mom. <laughs> Until one day, I heard another lady shout at the house of another Seventh-day Adventist family. And she would do the same. Lady or, 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 or Madam Sabbatarian. And I said, oh, now it makes it two. It would rarely happen that somebody would come in and knock on your door. But what do you think if there was, say, a fire in the neighborhood? Would they shout? And wait? And if nobody answers, would just wait and shout again? How long would it take if the house next to my house is on fire and I have to run and escape, how long would it take for them to come and actually knock? I would really say that they would knock right away if they would not enter with the door. See the point here? Jesus says, I will come right here in the middle. Then he says, I'm coming as a thief. Then he says, I'm coming quickly. And then he says, I am at the door. At the door of your heart. Yes. At the door of your home. Yes. At the door of your history. Yes, put them all together. Jesus is knocking on your door. Why? Because he thinks your door is adorable. What do you think? Because he is the door.